Well, first, I would like to say hello to everyone. I am Sydney McKinney. I'm the executive director of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. The National Black Women's Justice Institute is a Black women-led nonprofit working to end the systemic criminalization of Black women and girls. And I am certain that many of you on this call know that we cannot do that without transforming the ethos and the practice of our schools. I am beyond excited to be here with you today to launch the Black Girls Push Out and Criminalization in Schools Data Hub. We created this digital dashboard for the people and organizations who are advocating for the transformation of our schools particularly those advocating for the dissolution of exclusionary school discipline practices, including the removal of police, which create pathways to criminalization for young people, especially black girls. I believe wholeheartedly that data is a powerful tool for advocacy. For those of you who are working to create nurturing educational spaces where black girls can thrive and dream without limits, we created the Black Girls Push Out and Criminalization in Schools Data Hub for you. This hub makes data easily accessible so you can focus on changing policy within schools and at all levels of government without worrying about how you're gonna find the data to help you make the case. I know many of you joined this call for that very reason. I'm gonna wrap up just by thanking you for joining us for unveiling this really important resource. And now I'm gonna pass it along to Dr. Monique Kubson, President and CEO of Grantmakers for Girls of Color, author of Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools, and very importantly, the founder of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. Thank you, Dr. Sydney, and welcome, welcome, welcome to you all. I'm so excited. Uh, to be in space with you and in community with you, to welcome you into this uh, space. Um, the most important aspect of this work to counter the criminalization of Black girls in schools is to establish a foundation for us to know what's happening with them. And it has always been a critical part of uh, my work, it's been a critical part of NBWJI's work, it's always been an essential way for us to know where there are points of entry, where there are opportunities for us to establish remedies to these conditions that impact our girls, and for us to have some um, accountability and to establish that accountability in rigorous and ongoing ways. I'm thrilled to be here to welcome you to this work because I think I, I said this before we launched uh, the webinar that this is the vision. This is the vision for an institute. This is the reason that I felt it was important for Black women to lead space here and to move past some of uh, the ways that we come to understand where there are opportunities for us to intervene, where there are opportunities for us to amplify, and where there are opportunities for us to engage differently, for us to reframe and understand um, critical opportunities in this work, and for us to be in community doing it. So I'm really excited to, uh, to, to be in a space to learn um, how it can be easily accessible. I think one of the first reports that we did that talked about um, the overrepresentation of Black girls in schools and that demonstrated the continuous pattern of overrepresentation and disproportionality, um, you know, was a, a typed up document that, that was, you know, something that we had to mail out. And the vision was always to be in a space where folks, no matter where you are in the country, could have access to this information and use it to inform your advocacy efforts, your learning efforts, and most importantly, your efforts to counter the criminalization that we see taking place and to engage in the enactment and amplification of strategies for remedy. There are many people on this call who have been a part of this journey. Um, I see Dan Lawson is in the audience. I see uh, you know, that Falilla Bilal, who was one of the original teachers at the school that NBWJI, that I helped to launch um, for girls who experience push out and that uh, did the evaluation, that for which NBWJI did the evaluation is in the audience. Um, there are many of you who have been a part of this work in very specific, ongoing and tangible ways. And uh, I appreciate you being here and also being a part of a community with a host of other folks who continue to do this work, who continue to want to learn, who continue to engage in legal strategies, research and social science strategies, 
um, and other very critical interventions, such as those which um, I think Sydney already shouted out Dr. V, who we love dearly and who's been a, a, a comrade in, in this work for, for a long, long period of time. So no more talking from me. I know you're here to learn about how to use this hub. Thank you and welcome to you all. And I am in deep appreciation for NBWJI continuing to implement the vision for there to be this data accessible, easily accessible, and uh, let's get to work. Thank you so much, Dr. Kufsen, for grounding us in the importance of this issue and for all the work that you've done and continue to do. Um, to shine a light on it and transform schools into the safe places that they should be for Black girls to thrive. Um, my name is Dr. Janae Bonsulove. I'm the Director of Research and Advocacy here at the National Black Women's Justice Institute. And I'm so excited to be here with you all and to share the Black Girls Push Out and Criminalization in Schools Data Hub that this team has put together. It is a living resource really uh, featuring interactive data dashboards for champions of education justice, whether you're an advocate or policymaker, a researcher, educator, to provide data-driven insights that can inform and support your advocacy and policy efforts. So today we're going to introduce and demonstrate the tools and also dig into conversation about the practicality of the tool in advocacy and policy change. Uh, but before we get into it, I wanna shout out our amazing sponsors. This event is sponsored by Tides Foundation's Advancing Girls Fund and Communities for Just Schools Fund. The uh, Advancing Girls Fund is a Tides Foundation initiative that powers grant making for adolescent girls and young women of color and their allies, investing in spaces where they can learn, play, dream, and become powerful movement leaders. Our Tides sponsor was unfortunately not able to join us today, but we are so grateful for their support. And I'd now like to give space and pass the mic to Mariana Islam, who's the Director of Movement Partnerships at the Communities for Just Schools Fund, to just say a few words about their work and uh, this work and the importance to their mission. So welcome, Mariana. Thank you, Dr. Bonsu Love. I am so delighted to be here with our partners, uh, Dr. McKinney, uh, uh, Kyla Mickens, and the whole uh, NBWJI team. Uh, my colleague in these philanthropic streets, it's so good to see you, Dr. Moni Kufsen and our partners, um, Advancement Project, Ashley, excited to be here with you. Uh, they are among 80 of our partners in our network who work to empower young people, their parents, educators, and community members. And I see some of you on the call right now. So good to be with you. Uh, you know, all of you just working to build these liberatory education spaces in our schools and in our communities, liberatory education that really centers safety, dignity, justice, and wellness for all our students. And we build our network's capacity at CJSF to engage in this work together by organizing philanthropy to invest grants to grow and strengthen our network's space building organizations to really do the work of transforming community conditions for all students. And that means especially black and brown students and especially black girls and gender expensive young people who continue to be disproportionately impacted by the school to confinement nexus. And really critical to that work is what the NBWJI really brings to our education justice movement with their skillful leadership, which is to uplift the data, stories, and experiences of Black girls and gender expansive young people and to ensure that work is front and center in all of our work. And we appreciate uh, NBWJI's ability to do that and to work hand in hand with us, with our organizers and advocates to gain insights for our work. Uh, and earlier this year, we partnered uh, to convene our national and local partners to be in conversation and to inform the release of a fact sheet on the really troubling and unacceptable disparities that Black girls face with police contact in schools. And we explored the usefulness of data together as a network, uh, what could be made more clear, other important contextual elements that could be helpful to uplift and share. And the conversation was like incredibly rich in discussion. Uh, feedback, and also affirmation. Um, there was lots of beautiful affirmation on the call for the work that you're all holding and moving. And, um, you know, NBWJI followed through with more conversation and case study of our partners' work, which is now on their site. 
And this is actually not a common practice as one might think to be in that practice together to strengthen the research and the advocacy together. So we are excited. We are excited for the new data hub and excited by our partners who have been activated in this work for a really long time, who continue to um, walk uh, with us and who we continue to learn from uh, and who this data hub will serve. And we're excited um, about the many more who will move into action, including policymakers and philanthropy. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana, for those from Wax. Uh, CJSF and its partner organizations are really and truly vital to our work at NBWJI. So much appreciation to you. Uh, and now I'd like to pass it to really the, the linchpin of the dashboards that you're about to see. Uh, our research associate at NBWJI, Kyla Mickens, is going to take us through how to use this really vital tool. So Kyla, on to you. Thank you, Dr. Bonsulove, and thank you to all of our speakers and sponsors, uh, Dr. Kufsen. Your work really pioneered and launched the conversation about the needs of Black girls in schools, and I'm so honored and grateful to have you here. Um, so <clears throat> we've built this school discipline data hub using raw civil rights da data collection um, data, focusing on girls and really highlighting and visualizing the overrepresentation of Black girls across school discipline types, across states, across school types. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can start this demonstration. Okay, I think everybody can see it. I just need to move this out of the way. Okay, great. So we already know from an earlier publication from the MBWJI that black girls are overrepresented relative to their enrollment in all discipline sanctions counted by the CRDC. If we look at this chart right here, we see that Black girls had pretty st steadily been at about 15% of female enrollment, but between 23-ish to almost 50% of these disciplinary practices, these push-out practices that push them out of the classroom and often into the criminal legal system and just generally limit their opportunities in education and in life. So today we'll be zeroing in on referrals to law enforcement, but we have nine dashboards that include referrals to law enforcement, school-related arrests, transfers, expulsions, in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, restraints, corporal punishment, and seclusion, all of which, again, Black girls are overrepresented in. These dashboards especially highlight the ways in which Black girls are overrepresented relative to other groups. So I'd like to get started with referrals to law enforcement, which are incidents where a student is reported to any law enforcement agency or official for incidents occurring on school grounds during school related events or while using school transportation. So it's important to note, these can be school related arrests where we're actually arresting, arresting students, but this can also include things like citations where police are ticketing students uh, as a disciplinary measure ticketing them for tardiness, for truancy, for having a vape pen, something like that. And that results in fines and fees that they and their families have to pay. It results in them having to miss school in order to appear on court hearings. It involves spending the time and resources to either fight these tickets or to, uh, or to just pay them, acknowledging guilt, essentially. Um, and then it along with all the other uh, exclusionary discipline sanctions, it disconnects students from school and can lead to uh, poor, ac poor academic outcomes as well as um, poor mental health, all of that different stuff. So it's really essential that we understand the impact of this and with the data, who it is disproportionately impacting, which is black girls. So. Here we are in our dashboard. I'm going to go ahead and start by looking at the trends. So this graph right here that is loading, maybe it is, there we go, shows the rate 
of girls being referred to law enforcement over the four years of data that we looked at. So that's the 2011 to 2012, 2013 to 2014, 2015 to 2016, and 2017 to 2018 school years. This thick black line represents all female students. Uh, so what it tells us is across these four years, these school, four school years, about three girls per thousand enrolled in the United States were referred to law enforcement. But if we look at this red line that represents black girls, we see that they are disproportionately impacted, hovering between five and seven black girls per thousand in, enrolled in the United States that were referred to law enforcement. By numbers, that's 51,028 black girls in 2011 to 2012. Uh, 38,094 Black girls in 2013 to 2014. 48,632 Black girls in 2015 to 2016. And 43,996 Black girls in 2017 to 2018. These are tens of thousands of Black girls that are being impacted by these referrals, being arrested, being cited. And it's something that needs to end. But I want to zero in even more Actually, before I do that, this is a consistent pattern that does not just exist in the United States. It also happens on a state by state level. So I used to be a teacher in Louisiana. If I go to Louisiana, I see the same pattern repeated. Here's all girls. Here are black girls above that. I'm currently in Virginia. If I switch and go to Virginia, same pattern. Here's everybody else. And up here are black girls. If I go to Georgia, and I want to show some Georgia lawmakers what they're doing to Black girls, I can pull this one up. Here's everybody else, and way up here are Black girls. But I want to go ahead and zero in even more to look at these rates by school type. So we looked at four different school types, alternative schools where they push kids who are disciplinary problems into, uh, traditional public schools, charter schools, as well as juvenile justice facilities. Um, juvenile justice facilities, you don't see on referrals and you don't see in arrests because if you're in a juvenile justice facility, it's, referrals and arrests are a little bit redundant. But the pattern that we see here, um, there's actually two different comparisons being made in this chart. One, between the different school types. So we see that in alternative schools, it is especially the rates are especially high across the board for referrals to law enforcement. Um, so alternative schools down to traditional public schools, then down to charter schools. But the other comparison being made is actually one between Black girls and comparison groups. So we can see here that 29 per thousand Black girls en enrolled in alternative schools um, in the United States uh, were referred to law enforcement in alternative schools in contrast to 15 per thousand girls in general. Uh, for Black girls, that's about 750 Black girls being referred out of these alternative schools across the United States. Uh, if we change our comparison group, which we can do for any other race, I'm going to switch it to white, we see that these disparities increase and we can still see that this uh, thicker light bar represents our Black girls and this darker thin bar represents our comparison group. So that's what changes as you change these groups. And again, both this pattern of alternative schools down to charter schools uh, echoes across states and school years, as well as the overrepresentation of Black girls across all of these repeating. Um, so we can change. Again, I always go to Louisiana because that's got a special place in my heart. No white girls apparently were referred in alternative schools in Louisiana in comparison to 64 per thousand black girls. If I change the year, pattern pretty much stays the same, so on and so forth. So what I liked about this is that you can show how consistently it's happening by changing the year and you can demonstrate how consistent the pattern is as you go from state to state to state, which I think is very useful in presenting the problem. And the problem is again, that we are pushing Black girls out of the classroom and often into these situations where they will end up in criminal and juvenile legal systems. So the next thing I want to look at, we've sort of talked about how different states, that pattern of overrepresentation continues to happen, but there are states where referrals and other disciplinary types are more common than in 
others. And this visualization allows us to see that. So if we're down here, this is a state-by-state -state comparison of the rates of referrals to law enforcement. Get it to where you all can see it, right? There we go. And right now we're looking at across the United States, um, the rate of referrals to law enforcement in the 2017-2018 school year for all female students. So up here at the top, we have Virginia with seven girls per thousand, Pennsylvania with about seven girls per thousand. If I change this to black girls, we're going to see predictably these rates jump. And I want you to be prepared for how big they jump because they jump a pretty big amount. Boom. Now we're at 18 girl, black girls per thousand in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the state where black girls are most at risk of being referred to law enforcement. If we change this to rate, from rates to counts, we see that that amounts to Pennsylvania, 2,223 Black girls that were referred to law enforcement during the 2017 to 2018 school year. So this is a useful tool when you wanna see where your state stacks up in relation to others, um, in relation to the United States in general as well. We'll have a red bar somewhere in the rates that will tell you the rate of the United States in general, which in this year was 5.8. So black girl, six black girls per thousand were referred across the United States. And in all of these, it was even more. Next thing I wanna show you, this is our relative risk chart. And what this chart allows us to do is to directly compare the rates of black girls being referred to law enforcement to a comparison group. It allows us to understand, again, the overrepresentation in relation to other groups of girls. So these risk ratios can tell us whether Black girls are more likely to be referred to law enforcement, and if so, by how many times. They can tell us if Black girls are equally likely to be referred to law enforcement versus the comparison group, or they can tell us that Black girls are less likely. So these up here are the places where Black girls, I, we're looking at Black girls versus white girls, these are the states where Black girls' risk of referral in relation to white girls is the highest. Illinois, Black girls were about eight times more likely to be referred to law enforcement compared to white girls. Iowa, Black girls were about six times more likely to be referred to law enforcement. I can keep going. We got three times, all this different stuff. And when we get down to one, one is where you're saying, Black and white girls are approximately equally likely of um, being referred to law enforcement. And anything below that, you're saying that Black girls are uh, less likely. But it takes a very long time to get to that point. We are going down. We're still more likely, two times more likely. Da, 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 da. We're almost through with our 50 states. And it is not until we get to West Virginia, Tennessee, only about seven only about seven all right apologies for that okay only about seven states out of the 50 are um where are where places where black girls are approximately equally likely or less likely so all these other states more likely and by multiple times. Again, this is a chart that can be changed by year and we can change our comparison groups as well. Final visualization I want us to look at is our school level. So our school level um, visualization allows us to see across all races, what percent of referrals are happening at what level. That's the elementary level, middle school, high school, and then other slash multi-level, which would account for our K through eights, our K through twelves, all of that different stuff. And what this is telling us here is that referrals to law enforcement are pretty much concentrated in middle and high school, especially high school. They're not doing a whole lot of referrals for elementary schoolers. And that tells us where we need to locate our sort of efforts. And while this is true for this particular sanction, other particular other sanctions, especially things like restraint and uh, corporal punishment, are actually more likely to happen on the elementary school level. So, final thing I just wanted to show us before we went 
is if I am advocating for change and I want to show somebody how their how referrals are affecting Black girls in my state, I don't have to go to each one of these individually. I can go at the top. I can hit Louisiana again, because Louisiana, who that? And I can see the in, all three of these visualizations change to show Louisiana. So all of this is now showing me Louisiana, Black girls being more likely than others, so on and so forth. I can also go in and show them how consistent it's been across years if I change the years. And that will also change what's happening down here. So I am grateful for you all being here and allowing me to show off this dashboard. We are hoping to soon plug in district level data so where you will see all these same things on a district level, allowing for even further localization. And of course, as soon as possible, we want to add in some post COVID data. Um, so I'm excited to do that in the near future. I am now going to go ahead and kick it back to Dr. Bonsu Love. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Kyla, for taking us through one of these nine dashboards so that we can see it in action. Um, such great work that you put into this. And I'm seeing so many comments in the chat about one, how disturbing some of this data is, um, and also ways that it could be useful for folks. So that's really exciting to see that coming in. So now that we understand more about what push out is and some of the data that is at our disposal, I now want to talk about its practicality for advocates in education justice champions and what it means to put this data to work. So I'm really excited to be in conversation with a champion for Black girls that I have admired in this work for a very long time, Ashley C. Sawyer. Ashley is a senior staff attorney at Advancement Project. Ashley is committed to divestment from prisons and investing in freedom, opportunity, and joy for youth of color. Ashley was previously the senior director of campaigns at Girls for Gender Equity, or DGE. She was also a staff attorney at Youth Represent, representing youth with reentry related legal needs. And prior to that, Ashley was a Stanley Emerging Leader Fellow at the Education Law Center in Philadelphia, doing special education advocacy, and she led a policy effort to reduce the suspensions of Black girls. Ashley is an alumna of Douglas College Rutgers University, and she has a JD from the Howard University School of Law. Ashley, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your experience with us. So, you know, we've we've went through one of these dashboards on referrals to law enforcement, and you know, I'm sure you've seen a lot in your in your work over your time about what this just context behind these numbers, right? So I'm really excited to um talk a bit about how it can be used in advocacy. So you know, just seeing this data, what do you think, how how does this, how can this data be leveraged to really make the case for addressing the disproportionate discipline of Black girls? You know, and how, how can we use these dashboards to support policy changes uh, at the state or federal level? Thanks so much, Dr. Bonsu Love. I'm really grateful to be on this panel and to be a part of this conversation. Um, just on the most basic level, level this research or this dashboard tells a story that wasn't being told before so when i first started working on education policy specifically focusing on black girls about 10 years ago now there wasn't a lot of data that was disaggregated disaggregated you know i'm not a data person we talked about this but there was data that was telling the story about how Black boys were being disproportionately suspended, expelled, and arrested in schools. And there was data that was telling the story about gender and race really separately. And what was happening is in the conversation around dismantling the school to prison pipeline, we really were overlooking the ways that Black girls were impacted by school discipline practices and why how black girls were impacted by school push out because the data was so siloed and for the average policy person or education attorney like myself who isn't able to do the number crunching on our own we just didn't have a way to say 
this is what's happening with Black girls or young people who are gendered as girls. And so we were having this conversation about school discipline, and we were focusing on a broader picture of school discipline practices and practices around school exclusion. And we weren't honing in on gender. And when Black girls were getting pushed out of school, arrested, and having interactions with law enforcement, it was just completely getting overlooked. So I'm grateful for the work that you all have done to make this accessible and make this information useful. It, it seems really user-friendly, and that's the kind of thing that we can tell a story. And I can bring this to a city council person. I can bring this to a school board president and tell the story of what is happening. And I can also interrupt narratives around who needs support and who doesn't need support. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I love what you just said about um, interrupting, disrupting narratives, uh, because really that that's that's really the intention um, behind making this, this data more accessible to folks. I'm wondering if, if there's an example that you can think of or share from your work, your previous work where data has played a crucial role uh, in advocacy or policy change. I know you've talked about some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in, you know, not having access to disaggregated data and, and, and the like. So could you maybe share an example where data has played a crucial role in advocacy or policy change? Sure. And also thinking about how, you know, this new tool could have, you know, informed or enhanced those efforts. Sure, there's two um, examples that are coming to my mind. So when I first started in this space um, around 2015, I had the privilege of working with the local Pennsylvania ACLU and a local youth organizing group called Philly Student Union. And I think it was important when I noted that um, when you were going over, when you all were going over the data about the fact that Pennsylvania is a state where Black girls were most at risk for referrals to law enforcement. So it stands out to me that the of the times that we really used data was in Philadelphia. Um, and basically Black girls were getting arrested or having law enforcement contact in part because of dress code violations. So the way that it, it plays out in some school districts or in some communities, when the young person enters the building, they're scrutinized and surveilled based on how they're dressed. Do they have a bonnet on? Do they have you know bobby pins in their hair? Are they, um, what are they wearing? And in some schools that are policed, the first thing that that young person encounters when they enter the school building early in the morning is someone telling them, you are not dressed appropriately, or, you know, your shoes are going off, or, you know, alerting the metal detector, et cetera, et cetera. But the other interactions were happening with teachers and school administrators where they were giving students suspensions and disciplinary referrals for dress code violations. And we know that that is a practice that disproportionately impacts girls and gender non-conforming students and our ability to point to some of the data. And it wasn't this data at the time, but we were using um, a different data set. We were able to say, hey, girls of color are being suspended, disciplined and punished for something as frivolous as the clothes that they're wearing. And for a lot of young people, they're doing the very best that they can to make it there on time. And they put on what they could put on or they put on what felt best for them and where they felt most comfortable. And they don't need adults scrutinizing them, tearing them apart, putting them down. And so we were able to get the school district of Philadelphia to agree to end the practice of using in-school suspensions for dress code violations. And obviously there's still so much work to be doing. You know, some of the work that we've been talking about at Advancer Project is helping young people build campaigns to abolish school dress codes. But at the beginning of those conversations where we're talking about what changes need to happen in a school district or in a community, a lot of those conversations begin with data, begin with telling a story about how frequently students are getting kicked out of the classroom, how frequently students are being referred to so-called alternative education programming, and how frequently these things are happening. I think when you are in the forest, you sometimes can't see the trees. And so for the educators and the principals who are on this call, sometimes you might have an impression that your school district is doing great or your school is doing fine, and that the students in your community are not experiencing racial disparities and the data might be telling a completely different story. And so this is an incredibly helpful tool to push for the initial conversations and you build those conversations and you can bring it up to your school board. You can bring it up to state and you know federal policymakers to shift the conditions under which students are trying to learn. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, so much in, in what you just shared. And, uh, you know, although this set of dashboards didn't exist at the time uh, when when you were doing that organizing, uh, but we do have a suspensions dashboard now that definitely shows those um, those disproportionalities. And it sounds like, you know, at its most powerful, being able to pair concrete data that shows the scope of the issue along with the narratives of the actual young people, especially girls who are experiencing the things really makes makes it you know, real and urgent for the stakeholders that you're trying to move. Um, so I really appreciate you giving us that context in just the importance of data and advocacy and how it really should go hand in hand with the, the narratives and stories and experiences of the people who are directly and most impacted. Um, so that's really useful. And something else we also shared that um, I wanna lift up is, you know, the, this dashboard or set of dashboards actually um, shows and organizes data at the state and federal levels. And I mentioned earlier that this is a, you know, a, a living resource will also, you know, be able to add more granular data to be able to show at the district level, um, you know, for in context that you were talking about being able to show your, um, you know, school board, the extent of, of an issue in that particular district, I think would be very useful. So those are those are things that will definitely be rolling out um, in this dashboard or set of dashboards. And so really, I, I see the, a lot happening in the chat. And I would love to open up the floor to the audience for questions for us to answer live, um, whether it uh, you know, requires a look at a second look at the dashboard itself, or you know, from the experiences that we can pull. Um, opening it up to questions about this resource um, and how it can be used. While we're doing that, I want to just lift up what Dan Lewis and put it into the chat because it feels important. Um, I feel like, and Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you're pointing to the fact that. In most places, I think we are going to see racial disparities, but Dan wanted us to be skeptical where we don't see disparities. And I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the data collection, but I do think it's important to recognize that in this current political moment, there are states, I was thinking about Tennessee, that are increasingly hostile to reporting their data. So the data set that you all use from the civil rights data collection, there are states in you know that are moving more conservative and who want to pretend as if we live in a colorblind country who are being resistant and hostile to their obligations to report their data and so just because if you maybe see that your area your locality isn't you know telling the same story that you that you might be feeling on a day-to-day -day basis if you're going to a school or you're in a school district and you're seeing what's happening or young people are telling you what's happening but the school district or the state isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing to report the data at, based upon race you will get um a distorted picture and i think that's important it for me brings up the importance of um, the sort of qualitative conversations that you could be having with young people, um, making spaces for Black girls and Black queer and trans young people to tell you what they are experiencing in your local school district. And you can also tell a qualitative story or a different story, because I don't want us to underestimate the ways in which um, more conservative states are going to increasingly be reluctant to participate in the data collection going forward. Um, and Tennessee, as an example, has already talked about, they, they started a task force to um, stop, stop accepting federal money from the U.S. Department of Education as a way for them to circumvent their obligations under civil rights law, so Title IX and Title VI. And if they reject the $1.8 billion that they received, Tennessee specifically, then they don't have to report this data anymore. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen next year or immediately, but it is important to contextualize um, the limitations of data in a time period where there are states that are perhaps going to be increasingly non-compliant. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that is such an important point. Um, and, you know, just makes me think about um, just alternative routes to acquiring some of this data, whether it be, you know, public records requests, um, you know, which are not subject to the same non-refusal, <laughs> um, you know, so, and other, um, other avenues, I actually think that a Dignity in Schools uh, campaign had a, uh, a webinar recently about um, different data sources to pull um, from like the, the, the report cards that all states have to um, submit for the ESSA uh, law, just, you know, but the purpose of having this type of dashboard is to be able to not have to have folks go to different sources just to, you know, tell a, a data story, you know, having it all in one comprehensive place is really the uh, intention of, of this dashboard. And so um, we are going to do the work of, you know, pulling in, um, trying to reconcile the data that that we can get access to, to tell as complete of a story as we can about what's happening in schools. Um, looking for other questions, there's a lot, lots happening in the chat. So I'm trying to, um, Whole questions that um, haven't been addressed or um, insightful comments. Uh, another issue related to to data that I also wanted to be able to say is that um, the most recent data that we have in the dashboard is the 2017 to 2018 school year. Um, and although the 2020 to 2021 data is out and available, um, you know the CRDC has you know acknowledged the uh, that that school year was an anomaly year you know with the COVID nineteen pandemic um, and have warned against comparing that data to previous report years and I know that there are folks in the chat also warning about um, you know the incompleteness of data and how different schools you know are inconsistent in reporting their data and so we are pausing until the following school year, the 2022 to 23 becomes available to be able to, you know, put, put it in context with that COVID year's data so that, you know, folks are fully informed about, you know, what those, what those inconsistencies look like in comparison to, you know, what might be considered the norm, um, you know, where the data was more reliable. So I just wanted to name that. Um, if folks might be looking at the dashboard, like, oh, why is it just up to 2017 and 2018? There's lots of inconsistencies in reporting, especially for referrals um, to law enforcement and arrest uh, for that pandemic school year that I think is important to me. Um, and if folks do have questions, it is better visible to us on our end if they go in the Q and A. Um, things get lost in the chat, so. It. Dr. Bonson Love, do you mind if I lift up a couple of them in the yes. chat? Okay, so I don't want to mispronounce your name, but I think it's Ayumani. Um, I think someone may have already answered, but uh the data, and I'm I'm not speaking from a data expertise perspective, but I do know that the CRDC is not collecting data around gender identity and it's not collecting data. Um, so the data that you all use for the dashboard is from the federal government and the federal government is not tracking um, the data based upon gender identity. So they're only tracking information based on how the student is reported in their school records. And unfortunately, our country does not um, collect federal data for the most part, you know, that includes the expansiveness of gender. So it is kind of harder to tell that story, I imagine. But to me, that feels like another opportunity to be thinking about those qualitative data opportunities or just more conversations with young people. And I also have heard um, school districts and educators who want to tell that story about how queer and trans young people are being impacted by school discipline be kind of reluctant because young people may not want to disclose to their school that they are queer or trans. So the data won't reflect that because they don't feel safe to disclose that. And I am also concerned about whether or not we want some school districts, again, in, in this particular political climate, do we want school districts to know or target students um, 
based upon their gender identity. And so it is a, a shortcoming, I think, of the federal data, but it's also a sort of nuanced and complicated um, issue in the larger landscape around school push out. Yes, thank you for that, Ashley. Um, any other questions you see in the chat uh, to lift up? I'm sorry, I'm looking through. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, it looks like that question has been addressed. Uh, I also see a question about um, whether uh, NBWJI will be doing trainings on how to use the dashboard. Um, and I think the short answer is absolutely. If this is something that you're interested in, you know, bringing to your team, definitely reach out to research at nbwji.org and, and we can uh, discuss how, how to be able to better use this resource. Um, thank you for dropping that in the chat. Um, so I just want to kind of recap really the main takeaways from uh, this presentation and discussion is one chiefly like the great value of having data to really understand the scope of the problem and be able to inform and shape solutions. Um, understanding that, you know, all data isn't isn't perfect, but to be able to pair uh, you know, the the scope of the issue with deep narratives can really help it strengthen and inform advocacy and policy work. And so I really want to uh, one, invite everyone here in the audience to explore the dashboards further. I know we looked at uh, the referrals to the law enforcement dashboard today, but you can dig into the data on uh, arrest, which is a subset of referrals, suspensions, transfers to an alternative school setting, you know, restraints, corporal punishment, which is still legal in 17 states right now. Um, you know, th these data are available for you to play with, tinker with. Um, and I, I mentioned the research at mbwji.org uh, email to reach out to if you're interested in training, but also there have been lots of great insights about, you know, new things that it would be cool to see, or, you know, if there are additional questions that you have that you, you know, would love to see answered or reflected in these dashboards, um, suggestions, definitely welcome those as well to that email. Also today, we again looked at referrals to law enforcement and we've just released a new resource called Black Girls Contact with Police and Schools, a state by state overview on our website as well. Uh, Hope someone can drop the link to that. Um, looking at our comms team uh, in the chat, but will also be available in our post event uh, email. But encourage you all to check that out as well. Uh, there's some additional uh, data analysis in that report or in that brief that isn't on the dashboards. Really looking at uh, disability status and others. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, and lastly, when we hop off of this or exit this virtual room. Um, at the end of this webinar, you will see a, a post event survey pop up in your uh, pop up in your browser. And we really, really appreciate your feedback and thoughts about, you know, what you have learned and taken from this, uh, this event to really help shape our, uh, you know, future webinars around this and other issues. Um, so with that, and yes, thank you so much for continuing to add in the chat your uh, thoughts and queries. Um, with that, I really want to thank Ashley, uh, Dr. Kufsen, uh, Mariana, Kyla, everyone involved in, you know, making this event a success, but also thank you so much to the audience for your participation, everything that you've shared in the chat about your insights, your experiences and your questions. I just wanna reiterate how excited I am for the potential impact of these dashboards and these tools and the ongoing work to support black girls in schools that everyone on this call is engaged in. So 
much, much appreciation to everyone for joining. And thank you again, Ashley, for being in conversation with me today. And please take a moment to uh, to complete our post-event survey when, when you hop off of this. But wishing everyone great care and thank you so much for joining.